I'm facing the consequences of my actions. I hate the consequences of my actions. They're the worst consequences. some dance of get goodery. I assume you're talking about people who want to gatekeep the difficulty of particular video games. In this case, Elden Ring. And you know what? Good on them! Because what they want and what the developers seem to want lines up and it's extremely popular. You see, Jim, not everything is for you. And I can imagine it is somewhat tiring to have to fight against both developers and their many fans to try and take something they love and change it into something you want for yourself. I'm not particularly concerned if you're tired of fighting a battle that I hope you lose. Now, before we delve into what I know will simply be a very well-reasoned and thoughtful bit of content by Jim Sterling, I would like to remind you all that I currently have an amazing plush from the talented folks over at Makeship. For a limited time, a very limited time, you have the opportunity to support me and the talent over there by purchasing one of these super cool plushy shibi dogs of yours truly. They've been selling really well, so every one purchased by you guys helps me out a great deal. And honestly, they've done a fantastic job. These look great. The link is in the description below. Please go give it a look. And any support you give is very much appreciated. Now, on to Jim Sterling. Elden Ring has been released and with it has come a flurry of discourse, but the only real point in this discussion to be acknowledged is that I'm a better Elden Ring player than you. Oh, uh, we're doing a thing, aren't we? This is a thing? And I'm going to stake my entire identity on that. I might not be better at playing the game, but I'm better at enjoying the game. Wow, right out of the gate with a bitterness. I see what you're doing. You're making fun of a person that might only exist due to statistical inevitability. This reminds me of the last video I did, the, the discourse, if you could even call it that, of Elden Ring and the Dark Souls games. It seems to draw out this air of arrogance from detractors, not the fans. I promise I didn't plan this. I don't care about Elden Ring at all. I don't play it, probably never will. It's this game that just sort of seems to sit in the center of a few relevant controversies. Quantum TV, Jim Sterling, they both open their video with mocking people who want others to leave their game alone. Maybe there's just this, I don't know, terrible, cruel cabal of awful mean Elden Ring players out there, but I wonder if we'll actually have them pointed out or if their supposed existence is best left ambiguously non-verified than you, than all of you, really. Uh, 1v1 me as we discuss the themes, bruh. Yeah, I think generally if you're gonna open a video with mockery, um, it should have a point or a purpose. Are you making fun of people who want to discuss the themes of the game, or is is that not what you're saying? It's, it's a little confusing. I don't know, maybe something you can work on for future videos. I think that's all that really needs to be acknowledged, but I get paid to make videos so I can't just go, so I suppose we better talk about video games instead of playing them. Hmm, these two adjacent sentences, they're odd as a pair. I get paid to make videos so I can't just go. You're saying you wish you could just leave, but you're only staying because it makes you money, which is not a great way to open a video and endear me to your character off the bat. It makes me wonder about the motivations for what you say to come. Apparently, you're only in this for the money? So, I suppose we better talk about video games instead of playing them. You lament the fact you can't just play video games here, but you acknowledge that you are paid to not play them. If creating YouTube videos makes you miserable and you don't want to do it, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should do something else that you enjoy doing. If you would rather play games, then maybe streaming is something you should put more of a focus on. Is talking about video games not something you enjoy? Not something you want to do? I enjoy these things, financial viability or not. 
I think it's an interesting topic and the discourse surrounding video games will likely never end. There's so much to say and express yourself with. And I do recognize that this is probably, maybe, all framed by Jim as some kind of a joke, this opening bit. But is it really? What is the joke here exactly? The joke is, um, what? That Jim wouldn't be making this video unless Jim got paid? You know, I'm not one for the just shut up and play fucking video games rhetoric. I've noticed when people say that, just shut up and play video games, it's generally used in response to someone who's looking way too deep into something and won't drop something and they're being very annoying and everyone else just wants you to go away. So if that's what you're being told all the time, eh. I do in fact find it quite tasteless and borderline offensive at times. Again, sometimes people just want you to go away and leave them alone and so that's what they say to dismiss your presence. Side question though, is borderline offensive okay or is it not okay? If something's borderline offensive, is it is it not offensive so it's okay because it isn't offensive or is it approaching offensive so it's a problem that it's approaching offensive so we shouldn't say it? But that would make it offensive, right? Because if it isn't offensive, you wouldn't have it. I don't know. That's fine. I don't know. I guess I just don't care if you're offended, Jim. I'm often told to just shut up and play video games when I dare to talk about industry abuse or examine game industry trends through a mildly political lens or when I talk about social issues on my social media. I mean, I don't know, I, I really need to make some bingo cards because we've already started off with unfair characterization of other people that isn't going to get evidence, let's be frank. We have, um, I'm only doing this for the money and now we have boohoo, people are saying things to me I don't like. I, I don't know what the strategy here is. If it's try to be unlikable, I, it's working pretty good. The just play games attitude prevalent in the online gaming community is intellectually lazy. Yeah, that's kind of the point. People just want you to go away because you're being annoying if they constantly tell you that. Nobody says that thinking it's an intellectual argument. They just want you to go away. Whether their sentiment is justified or not is an entirely different thing that I don't care to get into. Or is that intellectually lazy? Philosophically cowardly. <laughs> Philosophically cowardly. Okay, calm down, Jim. And typifies aggressively apathetic centrism that one finds embodied by the privileged entitlement of a class of nerds that has never had to think about a real problem in their lifetime. Oh my god, you are bitter. Aggressively apathetic centrism. I'm not even sure what you mean by aggressively apathetic. It seems kind of like a contradiction to me. Maybe you mean they go out of their way to be apathetic when they shouldn't? Because I suppose in your mind it's bad to just want to sit down and play a video game without tying some political opinion or stance into your hobby. It just seems to be this horrifically toxic attitude of if you aren't with me, you're against me. Or maybe it's even worse, if you aren't with me enough, loudly enough, constantly enough, you are against me. I guess there is no neutral position. You can't just want to be left alone to enjoy a video game for what it is and have fun. You can't just be a warrior class. You have to be a social justice warrior class. And you know what? I'll, I'll say it now. I think centrism is all right. If you have a mix of left and right and center opinions and you come out averaging into a more middle position, you know, maybe that's not so bad at all. I think it means that you're willing to entertain ideas from across the political spectrum without being an extremist or an ideologue. As long as centrism is where you end up and not some pre-made destination or goal you're aiming for, I think that's totally fine and respectable. But I will say this, beware of people who see a lack of partisanship as a character flaw. And this idea that people are, what did you call them? One finds embodied by the privileged entitlement of a class of nerds that has never had to think about a real problem in their lifetime. A privileged entitlement of a class of nerds that has never had to think about a real problem in their lifetime. Jim, everybody's got problems. Maybe not the same amount of problems, maybe not the same kind of problems, but Jim, we all got problems. Some people don't have the incredible privilege of making YouTube videos for a living like you and I do. 
even if you only do it for the money, I guess. Most people work hard, tough, long jobs day in and day out. Some people have tough lives. And for many people, all they want to do is to get back home, take off their shoes, plop down on the couch, and have fun with the video game. They want to escape the problems they have. They want to smile and have fun for a while. And that's all there is to it. For you to paint all these uncountable people into bad guys and enemies that, that they don't have real problems? With these kinds of insults, it's just, it's honestly a really slimy thing to do. What have you become, Jim? All that said, if hardcore from software fans could just shut the fuck up and play video games, I think I'd enjoy that very, very much. Um, do they not? Let me specify that. I'm talking about a particular type of supposed, alleged, hardcore from software fan. But you've determined that they aren't really hardcore from software fans. You see, this is YouTube speak for, I don't think these people are actually fans of From Software because if they were, they would agree with me. I hope that later in this video you provide us with a criteria that you use to distinguish the real fans from the fake fans. That would be really useful for the rest of us to know. A new From Software game has been unleashed upon the world and with it has come the same tiresome, dreary, circular discourse that occurs whenever FromSoft offers up its particular blend of challenge, depth, beautiful bleakness and obfuscating lore. Very sorry that you had to listen to 15.3 seconds of Jim Sterling uninterrupted. Just think about how I feel. And also, don't worry, any negative side effects are temporary and will subside shortly. Jim! Dear Jim, do you edit your own videos? I don't know. You probably have it in the credits. I don't really care to check. Whoever edits your videos, be they Jim or otherwise, you can join all the viewers of this video in a quick little game, a little test, a little experiment, if you will. I am going to display on the screen for 2.1 seconds an image, and when you see this image, I want you to think about what your eyes seek out first. Ready? In the 2.1 seconds that you had to read that image, what was the first thing that your eyes darted to? Yeah, it was that for me too. It was Destiny 2, the Witch Queen. Now, obviously this won't apply to everybody, but I think the vast majority of people will have their eyes dart to the words that are prominently displayed in the center of that image. So, if you want people to look at the title of the article that you are referencing in the 2.1 seconds that you show it while also listening to you, well, gosh, now that I say it all out loud, maybe you just shouldn't have had this image at all. Also, I went to this article. It's not all that good. I might do a dog bites on it, but eh, I say skip it. Two images later, while you say circular discourse, you display this image. This is a two-year-old post from the Elden Ring subreddit. The title, which you um, seem to have omitted conspicuously in your presentation here, is Saddens Me. Casuals are going to moan about Elden Ring's difficulty. Hmm, I wonder why you cut that one out. I suppose you or your editor thought that this picture in particular would summarize the concept of circular discourse. Now, I would expect something that was circular discourse to be a little bit higher upvoted than only 74%, and this post only has an upvote rating of 27, which is not particularly high. Out of curiosity, I sorted by the top comments, and the highest upvoted comment in response to this post is, Obviously, if the game is too hard for you, then you are not its target demographic. I don't understand why some people don't get this. The game doesn't have to cater to you. Instead, you should find a game that fits your skill level. Or, get good. If you manage to get good, then you were their target demographic from the start. They really do need to get good, though. The third highest rated reply to this comment on Reddit says that you shouldn't brag about being good and diminish the people who aren't because it makes the community look bad. In fact, I found multiple comments that said this. If this is your example of circular discourse, then I'm going to have to ask what you mean by circular discourse. And I know it seems like I'm really putting the anal and analyze here when I'm looking at a one second long visual that he plays, but this is the visual, this is the example that he put in his video for circular discourse, and I just don't see it. 
I need to know what you mean by circular discourse now, because it just flat out doesn't seem to be here. Whatever you're using this as an example of, I, I don't know what it is. In fact, the discussion in the example that you chose to use, it kind of goes against your characterization of these Elden Ring players, if I'm to be honest. As per the usual, the endless debate over game difficulty and accessibility has reared its all too familiar head, and while I usually wade into the fray with embattled diligence to argue that easy modes are perfectly acceptable, optional, and not at all problematic in literally any video game, well, except for game developers who don't want their games to be easy, which is a perfectly reasonable and understandable creative choice that they can make when designing challenges for people to play. From software, it seems to be their thing. I don't want to take that away from them. Especially when what they've created seems to be extremely popular and beloved. If I was going to make a video game, then I would want to make one that has a decent level of challenge because I want to challenge the people who buy it. I want to present challenges to players to overcome. It would be nice if people who beat my video game you know, had some level of pride about that, real pride that felt earned if beating my game had a level of prestige to it. Did you hear that? Ice fell down on my mug. I've got this Yeti next to the microphone, and every once in a while, the ice at the top sort of just falls over and hits the metal of the... Yeah, I'm keeping that in. That's emergent storytelling. Anyway, it would be kind of nice if there was some kind of prestige to people beating my game. That would make me feel good, and it would certainly feel good to the people who played my game and beat it. Plus, that's my artistic, creative decision, and it's not something for you to change or demand that I change, and you can't give me one good reason why I should... Especially considering that I specifically don't want my game to be for everybody. I'm not going to argue anymore, because it's not an argument these days, it's just a performance. Are you saying that people who disagree with you and don't think that every game should have an easy mode, you're saying that they don't have any arguments for that, they're just performing? Do you understand how ironic that sounds? No, you don't. If you did, you wouldn't have said it. The community is on autopilot with this endlessly repetitive debate. Nuh-uh. You are on autopilot with this endlessly repetitive debate. See? I can do it too. It's easy. There's no hope of a resolution. I don't know. I think there's always going to be people who think like you, and I think there's always going to be people who think like me. I don't engage in arguments because that specific argument one day, I believe, will simply be resolved. Especially things like this that are certainly not objective. The fights on these discussions, they may be perpetual. They will outlive you and I, Jim. But I'm still gonna do it. I'm still gonna fight. And hopefully along the way, I'll change a few minds. Long ago, this whole discussion became nothing but an exercise in grandstanding. Um, I... I don't know what you're talking about. I legitimately don't. I'm not grandstanding, so... I mean, I want to make videos and get views and have an audience and get my perspective out there. Like, sure, there's some performative element to all of the videos that we make, but I do believe this. It's not just some grandstanding performance. I actually believe what I'm saying. If you're talking about how you think it's futile because there is some subset of the, I guess, Elden Ring community, in your view, that is going to think a certain way or act a certain way, I mean, I'm... I guess it's, that's up to you. If that's your jump ship point, then fine. I guess I'm just glad that I don't think that way. I've pointed out before that for all my show gets accused of repeating points, which it does, yes, actual gamer discourse is itself perpetually recycled garbage. I absolutely disagree with that. 100% I disagree with that. Look, I don't even play Elden Ring. I don't give a shit about Elden Ring. Probably never play it. It's not for me. You don't hear me whining and bitching about how it needs to be easier. When I can't... Uh, I'm just making noises now. I'm sorry. I have a podcast called Every Frame of Pause, and we did, a, we did an episode for many hours on Elden Ring, and we had a wide variety of differing perspectives. Some people didn't like it as much as other people. Some people loved it. Some people were in the middle. There was a lot to criticize, a lot to talk about. The discussion on the difficulty of the game certainly arose, and I heard things I'd never heard before. I was genuinely listening to other people's perspectives, even if I didn't have a particular care about specifically playing Elden Ring. And it just seems like whining at this point. You said actual gamer discourse is itself perpetually recycled garbage. I, 
I don't know how someone... I, I just do not have this horrifically negative and derisive opinion on gamers and their discourse that you do. And I'm pretty blackpilled about a lot of stuff, like movies and things of that nature, general audiences and the way they see things, but I'm not going to give up on trying to change minds. I'm not going to take this fatalist attitude that it's all just doom and gloom, and I'm not going to... Mm, don't like it. This whole video is just coming across as you being bitter and whining. The same tiny handful of debates repeating themselves over and over again. I don't think that the gaming discourse is just a tiny handful of topics, but if you do, then I don't know. Look harder. Stupid and insignificant controversies surrounding review scores. Yes, I am certain, Jim, that there are some controversies that relate to gaming scores that are indeed insignificant and not worthy of discussion, sure. But I am certain that there are also review score discussions that are substantive and interesting. Why certain publications and certain people give certain things the scores that they give them, that can be potentially very interesting, especially if they're very influential persons and in publications. I find this particular comment very odd considering that even I remember a particular video that you made a number of years back. A video called, So about that time I gave Hellblade a 1 out of 10. Because you gave Hellblade, Senua Sacrifice, a 1 out of 10, then you made this video explaining why that was a mistake. When you gave Hellblade a 1 out of 10, you were an influential video game reviewer, your score mattered to a lot of people, it generated a little bit of a controversy, and then you reported on that controversy. I assume you still stand by this video? I don't see why you wouldn't, honestly. Have you changed since then? I don't know, I, I guess I just feel like I wouldn't be so quick to devalue con- I almost say it like con- Because I want to say controversy, right? Because I'm from America land, I say controversy, but then I hear someone else say controversy, and then my brain is just like, oh yeah, just, just do that, say that, that's fine. What was I talking about? Whether or not a game is too woke for daring to have women and queers in it. I mean, I don't think games are woke for just having women and queers in it. Can I say queers? Is that okay to say that word? I, I'm technically LGBT. I'm the B, right? So I can say queers. Is that how? I don't know what the rules are today. So I can't say that, right? He said it. He said it first. If I don't know what the, I can someone can someone just email me like the rule book on what I am and am not allowed to say based on my skin color, sexual orientation, um, gender identity sexuality can can i can i just get because someone sent me a pdf of the rules so i know if i can say queer or not the gatekeeping aversion to accessibility in protest of the mythical casualization of video games and wait hold up there, there's a lot in there all right let, let's do that let's do the first thing first accessibility and difficulty are two different things they are adjacent they often rub up against one another and get kind of fuzzy and conjoined in the middle but they are two different things. I'm not necessarily keen on grouping the two together depending on what context you're gonna be talking about them with because I'm pretty, I don't know, I'm pretty keyed into gaming discourse. I pay a lot of attention to it and it is rare if ever, if ever, I hear generally from gamers that they don't like accessibility. So when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about um, Remember that thing in The Last of Us 2? Shit game. But remember that thing in The Last of Us 2 that was really neat? That super high contrast mode that let people who couldn't see as well kind of like pick out what's happening so that they could play the game? That's not about difficulty. That's about accessibility, okay? I don't know anybody who had a problem with that. That seems like a really good thing to have. I think we all agreed on that, regardless of where we lie in the political spectrum and... Just any, I think we can all get behind that as being a good thing. It's legitimately neat. I mean, I play with some people. Like when I play, I've got some friends and acquaintances. They play Apex Legends, and they constantly talk about how much they like slash hate the color blind options and the way that it looks on their game. So it, no one doesn't want these things. Okay, not that I know of. I su I suppose you could find some crazy person who's literally against actual accessibility, but that is different. That is different than just saying games need to be easier. 
And you simultaneously cannot sit here and say that games need to have an easy mode. I'm advocating for games needing an easy mode. It's good when they have an easy mode. There's no reason for them to ever not have an easy mode and then say, ah, yes, the myth of casualization. Like, I thought that, I see, this is, this is kind of news to me. I thought that we were all in agreement that games were getting more casualized, right? Games used to be, uh, there used to be a lot more, I guess it depends on how you want to qualify the metric of games getting more or less casual. But when people talk about old games, they don't talk about, ah yes, old games that were really, really easy. No one ever says that. Where it's difficult to practically not find a game that's easy these days. As far as your claim goes that video game casualization is only a myth, which on the face of it struck me as very bizarre, I wanted to get other people's input, so I asked a poll on YouTube, and after getting 12,000 votes, 89% of people said, yeah, there is a trend of video games getting more casualized. Is the ever-increasing presence of pay-to-win mechanics not the ultimate casualization? Where you completely remove skill and ability from the equation altogether to the point where you can just pay money to essentially freely beat the challenges? How is that not the most casualized thing that there could be? It, it goes past the game itself in terms of casualization. Do we want to even talk about the scourge of mobile games? Now, I don't have a problem with some games being casual. There are games that I play and I enjoy that have a casual nature, and that's part of the reason that I like those games. But to claim so matter-of-factly that it's a myth that games are generally getting more casualized, it strikes me as bizarre. Where have you been? Uh, that's it, isn't it? Craig, are there any more things that the gamers care about? Wait, how do you not know what gamers want? Are you are you that out of touch? Are you that out of tune with... You talk about games for, like, a living. How do you not know this? Are you sure you're qualified to talk about this subject? If it was said that Jim doesn't play video games at all, I can see how some people would believe that. That pretty much is all that the full-time hardcores who've made their entire identity gaming give a shit about, right? You know, can't say I'm surprised. Label and dismiss, always a classic. These people who don't agree with me, ah, uh, they're just these hardcore no-lifes and they've just made their entire existence uh, gaming their identity, blah, 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 blah. You, it doesn't matter, you don't have to listen to them, it's dumb. So, fun fact, if somebody did make gaming the core of their identity, that wouldn't mean that their arguments are wrong. It wouldn't mean that their opinion is invalid. And let's be honest here, how many of these people actually exist? for real. It's probably just people who are passionate about a hobby that they love, and you don't like that. You take that passion and you just say, no, 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 they're, they're just X, Y, Z. I'm going to call them these things, and then I don't have to worry about anything they say because I've called them a thing. I don't know, maybe not. I don't particularly care anymore. Maybe I left a few more regurgitated topics off the list, but it won't have been many. God, just... Just fuck traditional gamer TM discourse. It's just so... So fucking puerile. Which is definitely not what this video is, not at all. And I've been doing this job for over 10 years and nothing's been resolved. Nothing has changed. Do you mean to say that nothing has changed in video games in 10 years? The growth of microtransactions, the emergence of the live service business model, the explosion of PC gaming popularity. I mean, we have handheld consoles now. There's E3's cancellation, the viability of gaming IPs as popular cinema and television. We've got the incredible leaps in technology over the last 10 years, the flourishing of the indie game scene, the growth of esports. I, that's just off the top of my head. If you think nothing has changed in 10 years, then... Jim, sometimes I wonder if you've been paying attention at all. It's pretty clear that you just aren't a good listener in general, but for somebody like you, I just cannot fathom how you could think this. Where have you been? Do you mean, do you mean gamers haven't changed in general in 10 years? I don't even really know what gamer means at this point since it's become such a broad, popular hobby. So... I assume that means you're saying that gamers are just, because I haven't changed, gamers are just as bad now as they were 10 years ago? That gamers have been bad for 10 years? I, I don't know. I've been playing games for ages now, and I've had gamer friends for just as long. Some stick around, some come and go. 
and I've never once thought negatively about them because of that shared hobby. And if you seem to have this prolonged, horrifically negative view of gamers... Eh... Why did I respond to Jason Scryer's tweet? Why did I do it? Why do I do these things to myself? That's all my replies have been for days! Oh, well, it's easy. You did it for likes on Twitter. You did it because you thought everybody would agree with you. You weren't wise enough to understand that if you took a contentious potential gaming issue like uh, this one here. And I went to your tweet and Jason's tweet to take a look at things, and the comments are definitely very divided. There's, there's a lot of discussion and debate surrounding this topic in Elden Ring. And, and don't worry about the topic itself, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion. But you weighed in, rather combatively, and what, what did you think would happen? No, really, what did you think would happen? I guess you thought everybody would just agree with you and sing your praises, but... I mean, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't be teaching you how to internet. You've been doing this for too long. I shouldn't have to. We could have all been just simping over this selfie. Ugh, no, ugh. But instead, everyone's talking about whether you need a notebook for Elden Ring. Mom, you brought it up, so I suppose it's fair game. Taking notes in video games. Is that bad? Because I don't recalling anyone deciding it was bad. Because I, I, I'd like to think that generally gamers aren't so brain starved and hyper cracked out on energy drinks that they can appreciate a game that might encourage them to maybe take some notes. Because I've actually got something interesting to show you. These. You know what these are? These are notes. Notes for a video game. Well, not just a video game. Many. These are my father's notes. Mist. Time-lapse. Riven. Obsidian. That was a trip. Circle of Blood. Pegasus Prime. More. He wrote these down with his own hand, and he wrote them as far back as 1997. That's 25 years ago he wrote these. And he didn't just write them, he saved them. He kept them all. He moved house since then, and still, my father kept them. These notes were a part of those games' experiences. It was a symbol of accomplishment and effort. He wouldn't ever throw them away. When I read these tweets of yours, when I, when I watched this video, Jim, I remembered that yellow notebook he kept by the Macintosh when he played through these games way, way back when I was just a little pupperino shibi. When I went over to go collect the notes for these pictures, and I was thrilled that he'd actually save them, he looked through them and he remembered specific puzzles and locations from games that he had played decades ago. So long ago that many of you watching this video weren't ever even born when he solved them. But these notes that he took playing those games, it brought it all back. Switches and pins and levers and symbols, patterns, maps and diagrams. He was able to look at these and remember specific individual puzzles from specific individual games. Some of which he distinctly remembered with a great amount of clarity and had commented on how difficult some of them were. Many of these games he eventually ended up selling to other people, but he kept the notes. Those notes are a part of an emergent experience that happened when he had to interface with that game, not just in terms of a keyboard and clicking because of a CD in a machine. It's like a unique memory map of his experiences. And I wax poetically, but of course not every game needs notes. Not every game has puzzles, or is a puzzle game, and not every game should require notes, I'd say, but I do think that there can be, certainly, a great quality in adding this aspect to a video game's experience. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe you see that as just a, a boring side chore. But I wouldn't be so quick to write such things off as, um, fuck doing this. Maybe and I suppose this relates to Elden Ring, maybe I wouldn't mind games holding your hand a little less and encouraging the player to write some things down once in a while. Maybe that used to be a thing that was more normal. Maybe people don't expect to have to do that. They consider it work. They don't consider it part of the game or part of the experience. And also, what does having memory issues have to do with taking notes other than, um, than that they might be more necessary? Wouldn't taking notes help you if you had memory issues? seems like an odd thing to bring up. In ADHD, 
Yeah, I don't know. It just sounds like you're using a mental issue you have as some kind of a badge so you can act as if your opinion has extra authority. I shouldn't have done it. I do it to myself. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Elden Ring. It's a very good game. While we're on the topic, it's quite forgiving by Soulsborne standards, but given the series penchant for punishing its players' mistakes, that's not saying too much. You know, I wonder how easy a Souls-like game can be before people stop complaining. Maybe it'll never go away, this little cottage industry based around the discussion of is this Souls game too difficult or not. Regardless, there's been another shitstorm of debate over how accessible it should be. Again, it's important to clarify, a game's accessibility and a game's difficulty, these are related oftentimes, but they are absolutely two different things. Whether easy modes are the devil. Oh, calm down. Let's not act like gamers who enjoy difficult games, or hell, gamers that enjoy any particular experience, shouldn't be very skeptical of any attempt to lower the requirements for completion of those experiences. Particularly when the completion of these games is seen as an accomplishment because of that very difficulty. You can't point fingers and castigate them because of their resistance to outsiders wanting that game to be more accessible for the sake of outsiders. And the merits of obtuse, willfully uninformative game design. Obtuse, uninformative gaming design. Maybe you have an example in your mind. It would have been nice if you shared that with the rest of the class. Or maybe you didn't have anything in mind and you just thought you'd throw that in there to a list of people that you thought might agree with you. And just, God, I'm tired of it. Well, I, you're not that tired of it. Here we are. That's what I thought as my Twitter replies were inundated. I actually don't want to hear it anymore. Well, you went on social media and you said something controversial in a dickish way. I don't know what you expected. And for all the moaning you'll do now, I'm certain in no time at all you'll be back to your old self, saying controversial dickish things. The fan base is indeed fucking exhausting. Well, hey, good news. I am not a part of the Elden Ring fan base. I've never played the game, probably never will. Though, I have been called exhausting before. The get good attitude that has festered among hardcore Souls fans for years is truly contemptuous at this stage. I found this article on Ars Technica, putting Elden Ring's 12 million sales in context. It's written by Kyle Orland. And in this article, it has a very useful graph to show just how incredibly popular Elden Ring was versus previous FromSoft titles. This, um... I guess you could call it a demographic of gamer, is only getting larger and larger as time goes on. The idea that within this ever-expanding demographic that you need to get good at the game and that games often are supposed to be difficult and they should be difficult and if you cannot complete them then that's too bad. In the, uh, the way that you overcome that is to practice and to get good. I'm sorry that you find that so, as you said, contemptuous. Get Good once started as a joke, but has since been taken far too seriously by people who stake far too much of their self-esteem on whether or not they can fight a pretend dragon without any friends. Well, honestly, it seems like you've staked far too much of your self-esteem on the fact that you can't. As for getting good being taken too seriously, I do hope you'll explain how that is, because it seems like this attitude that has given this series of games its reputation has only helped to further solidify that these kinds of games have a very revered and a deserved place in the gaming landscape. Oh, and can we not can we can we not do this thing where you you sneak in pretend when you describe elements in video games like you're trying to 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 try and denigrate them or lessen the impact of their achievement just because it's digital and not real? Yes, the dragon isn't real. Thank you. We know you're just trying to tear it down as an accomplishment to try and cheapen the experience of the people that you clearly find contemptuous. It's worth noting that nobody's actually impressed if you're brilliant at video games. None of us actually care. In fact, the more you brag about it as if it's worth a damn, the more we think you're fucking pathetic. I don't know who this we is that you're speaking for. Perhaps it's another demographic of the gaming population that will also remain rather ambiguous and open-ended to interpretation. When it comes to how much people care about the skill of other people, it depends on what tier we're operating on. 
First off, let's go ahead and get this out of the way. You will regularly impress other people if you play well. If you jump into a game and you do very, very well, you are going to impress a lot of the people who are in that lobby or in that server. They might not say it, they might not type it out loud, they won't send you a message, but when they look at that scoreboard, when they see your behavior in the game and how good you are, there will be a lot of people who are impressed by that. In all of your video gaming, if you're never impressed by somebody else's skill and talent, then that's a you thing. And you can try and group yourself as part of the majority, or you can try and lump in other people with you if you wish, but that is not typical. However, the kind of gamers that you would just meet uh, in games as you play and be impressed by, that's not even the top level, not by a long shot, because... Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there's this thing going on, and it's called eSports. Esports is really big, and it's getting bigger, and expectations are that it will continue to keep getting bigger. Now, to say that nobody is impressed and that nobody cares about people who are good about video games is simply, it, it's just, it's just flat out wrong. You're letting your anger at the contemptuous gamers get in the way of what's blindingly obvious in the industry. And even if you don't care, like me, I don't personally care about esports, I don't follow it in any way, but... Damn, have you seen those guys play? If you're not impressed by that, then I don't know what to tell you. Okay, that's harsh. It's okay to feel accomplished at making your way through a particularly challenging video game. Ah, well, um, all right then. But once you start talking about it as if it makes you better than other people, if you start sneering at those who needed help and bemoaning video games being made more welcoming to newcomers or those with disabilities, you can just go ahead and fuck yourself. Now, there's an entire discussion to be had around how, um, how simplified a game can be in order to welcome new players in before it simply changes the experience, or until it breaks from the creative vision of the game's developers and the experience they're aiming to give players. There's a difference between that and the discussion on how much video games should really change in any way to attract people who otherwise wouldn't be interested. So don't act as if you can just slide in those potential groups into the get good sayers you'd mentioned before as if they're all overlaps on some bizarre Jim Sterling Venn diagram. Because I highly doubt that any of the people who are telling you that you need to improve at video games if you want to beat them if they're difficult, I, I highly doubt that many of them are saying, no, fuck disabled people playing video games. Because we're doing that thing again, we're doing that thing again, Jim, where we're conflating difficulty and accessibility when it's useful to an argument, and it's not a good look. You've been doing this for years, you need to quit. Literally, fuck yourself. Alright, calm down, kiddo. Because Lord knows I don't think you should inflict your pointless little genitals on anybody else. There's no debate to be had here. Whoa, whoa, what's this about making fun of people's genitals? I thought that size shaming and making fun of the size of people's genitals was a, uh, well, I'm just, I don't think that's very progressive of you, Jim. Because I don't even want to begin imagining how much you'd bitch and moan if someone commented on the shape of even a um, digital female character's bust size. And if the person saying that it was fair game to insult people based off the size of their genitals, if if that person were to be, say, I don't know, disgustingly obese, right? Would it be, hypothetically of course, would it be okay for someone to make fun of that person for their morbid obesity? I'm not saying it would be, I'm just, I'm just asking hypothetically if that would be the case. I'm, I'm just saying in this hypothetical scenario, should those who live in grass huts throw spears? There's no debate to be had here. No argument. I could actually provide a litany of reasons why accessibility in a video game is good. You see, you're doing the thing. We're, we're talking about difficulty. When people say, get good, they mean that you need to get better at the game. You need to practice. You need to improve. You need to, you know, just, just put some time and effort into it. They are not saying that there are certain accessibility options and uh, things that can be in a game that allow people with disabilities to play it at all. No one who says get good means that. You're living in a fantasy world. 
And because, as you said, you have no arguments to give, you're, that you're not even going to bother, you, what you have to do is the same song and dance you've been doing for years, where you confuse in a discussion about game difficulty, accessibility. Because, let's be clear, you and I both know that it would be very difficult for you to actually make an argument against people who want Dark Souls to remain difficult, but it would be really easy to instead flip that into something different, which is the people who want Dark Souls to stay difficult and for you to practice and get better. Actually, they want to exclude disabled people from gaming. That's how you want to frame it. And people aren't buying it. I could point you to Laura Kate Dale's accessibility series. In fact, actually go look at that series. It's very good. Yep, I'll get right to that. But to make the arguments here on this show, I feel like I'd be wasting my goddamn time because they just need to be said again the next time a hard game is released. That's an interesting piece of philosophy. If you have to repeat it, it's not worth saying. <sighs> Jim Sterling. It's odd that I'd ever have to tell you this, but the simple fact of the matter is that Sometimes, you might have to repeat arguments as years go on. Maybe, and just maybe, the issue won't be settled in one go. In fact, things virtually never are. It's a long and drawn-out fight, discourses can be. And if you want to change minds, it may... it might take reiteration and rephrasing. I'm sorry that you feel that your ability to persuade is so ineffectual and unworth the time. I know you feel bitter about this, that much is blatantly obvious, but maybe. It's not worth feeling callous and upset because you haven't changed all the minds out there quite yet. And honestly, if this is going to be your approach, how successful do you think you're going to be at that? And gamers TM glom onto it to swing their dicks around. Let me just say this, plain as day. Oh boy, I can't wait for this incredible insight. The more accessibility options a video game has, the better. Yeah, we're talking about accessibility when there's no argument that's being made that games shouldn't be made more accessible. What's interesting here is that you're using the example of The Last of Us 2, which as far as I can recall was universally praised for having these high contrast modes to help people who have vision difficulties. I, don't, I literally don't remember anybody having a problem with this. I mean, I guess law of averages, there's going to be someone out there who didn't like it, but obviously we're not going to give them the time of day. And that's just that. That's just the way it is. Well, I mean, it's certainly the claim being made. This isn't a subjective opinion. It sounds like a subjective opinion. There is no debate here. It's a stone cold, goddamn, fucking fact. You know, this is all coming from someone, uh, myself, right? I'm, I'm pro-accessibility options. I want those to be a thing, right? But, I mean, no nuance, just the more options the better, period. End of story. There's no situation, there's no scenario where more options might make the experience worse. I mean, look, I guess I'm going at this all wrong. I'm thinking about this in terms of a discussion to be had. And this is clearly not the place for such things. I should ball my paws in self-righteousness and bellow that my way is the way. I mean, I wouldn't use this tactic for things that are far more serious in life, such as, uh, such as racism or sexism or, or slavery. I, I would never try and convince somebody who was pro-slavery into the emancipatory counterposition by simply saying that slavery's bad and nothing needs to be said. If someone truly thought that slavery was fine, then I would present arguments. I'd give philosophy, I'd give principled virtued reasons against it. I would, I would work to convince them out of their position. By saying that there isn't a debate to be had, I mean, that isn't particularly convincing when people say it to you, I'm sure. So why do you think it would be convincing to anybody else? Or maybe you've just given up. Literally every game is better when it has more accessibility options. I mean, you're just saying the claim again. And while I will probably generally vastly agree with you, that isn't going to convince people. Not that you probably need to convince many people that games generally are going to be better if there's more accessibility options. And the more accessibility options literally every game has, the better.
Like, it's never made sense to me that anybody would have a problem with more people enjoying a good game. You know, I'm, I might start skipping portions of the- I, I try not to do that in videos, I try to give the whole video its chance, but... If he just keeps going on about accessibility, when it's not what- <laughs> When it's just like, essentially irrelevant, I- I just don't have any more to say, I suppose. First of all, more people having a nice time is never bad. Why would you not want other people to have a nice time unless you're a misanthropic shitfucker? Oof, um, is... is this a serious question? Are, are we for real right now? I mean, outside of the realm of video games, this is just obviously absurd, but even as far as video games go, is it that simplistic with you? Should... Should video game developers make games with the goal of giving as many people as possible a nice time? Should there not be niche games? If you're making a video game and you want to create a gaming experience that one million people will enjoy, is that worse than creating a gaming experience that only 999,999 will enjoy? What if, what if the experience is greatly diluted in order to appeal to more people? Is it better to have a, a large number of people having a nice time instead of a small number having an incredibly deep, emotionally moving and satisfying time? I mean, then we just have the practical elements of it. What if adding accessibility options simply takes too much time or, or work or money to add for the relatively, well, relatively tiny benefit it adds overall? And honestly, that's not even starting to consider the more philosophical elements of the more people who have a nice time, the better. I mean, is it morally justified to condemn or neglect a few so that the majority can have a nice time? These are some pretty deep questions. I mean, you're the one who explicitly asked this. Why would you not want other people to have a nice time unless you're a misanthropic shitfucker? You ask why I wouldn't want someone else to have a nice time unless I was a misanthropic shitfucker. When the smoker fills his lungs with poison, they have a nice time. When the junkie injects heroin into his veins, he has a nice time. When the schemer fools a victim into a scam, he has a nice time. When the dictator crushes his population, he has a nice time. Hell, when, when a masochist tortures the innocent, he has a nice time. Am I a misanthropic shitfucker when I see somebody else having a nice time and want to deny what could also be bad behavior? When somebody's nice time could mean the oppression or harassment of others? And not even going to mention children and all this, how often does a child choose to have a nice time at the expense of their development or well-being? <sighs> I mean, I obviously I'm looking at this far more in depth than you intended. It, obviously, I, I really do understand that, but it just kind of goes to show that you might ask these really seemingly obvious questions with even more obvious answers, but maybe it really isn't so. Second of all, if you love these games as much as you claim, surely you want more people to enjoy it. Uh, generally, yes, but that would depend on what changes are made to the game in order to do that. The more successful the game is, the more it reaches people, the more money it'll make, the more content will be made available, the more game you will have to enjoy. I wouldn't really link how successful a game is and how many people it reaches as being, you know, that strong of a bond. There are plenty of games that we all know about, but are bad and didn't do well, and there's plenty of games that are, you know, incredibly successful, but they're, you know, they have their own niche audiences, they're not super popular. As for the rest of it, I generally would agree. Yeah, it's it's probably likely that the more people play it and enjoy it, the better it will do in the long run. Um, but it's also the case that as a game gets more successful, it can try and appeal to too broad an audience and ultimately change what it originally was that I enjoyed in the first place. Plus, the more successful a game is, the more people that it reaches, the happier the developers will be. Uh, maybe. That, that, that can be the case, potentially. But there's a lot of developers out there who have made bad games that a lot of people bought, and those games have a very bad reputation now, and I'm sure those developers aren't too thrilled about that. And I'm sure there are developers who are thrilled with maybe having smaller games that have a very um, focused and uh, a very dedicated but small fan base. And do they not deserve to be happy after making you happy? Does a developer deserve to be happy if they made me happy? Um, 
no. At least not necessarily. I legitimately need a moment to think about this. The entire discussion around the question, who deserves to be happy, is just... Look, I, I think it's just one that I'm not actually sure I'm well-versed in exploring. I think this is a far more complex discourse than you've alluded to. I'm gonna be honest, I just don't know where to really start tackling this as a premise for a video like this. I mean, if they're making good products and they're being ethical and trying their hardest, I, I guess I want them to be happy, sure. But, um, I mean, does Mussolini deserve to be happy because I'm happy when the trains run on time? Does Hitler deserve to be happy because his anti-animal cruelty laws make me happy? I think it's, it's a far more complex question than you might think. I guess I haven't really considered the deservingness of having happiness as such a transactional affair. Surely that's overly simplistic. The only people who would, in fact, have a problem with that are pricks. Gatekeeping. Elitist. Sad little pricks. <laughs> okay, if you say so. And this is why I decided to make no substantive arguments in favour of accessibility today. Yeah, no, no, we know. You're not making arguments because you think that the people who don't already agree with you are sad, pathetic, damaged people with tiny penises and they're bad and fuck them. Yeah, no, no, we get it. Yeah, you've made that abundantly clear. Because the people who need to hear it explicitly don't want to. They don't care. They're selfish. <sighs> you have such a myopic view of the world, of people, clearly of discourse in general. Maybe sometimes the people who need to hear your message the most are the people who you should work hardest to give it to. Maybe people simply don't normally think about these. So, you know, you know what I'll say? Most people just don't think about this. They have other things going on in their lives. The accessibility or difficulty arguments about their presence in video games. It's just not something that most people ever really think about. You're listing all the problems of the people who don't already side with you. And even a doggo like me, who's probably mostly in agreement with you on at least the accessibility element, you come across as rancid, unreasonable. You sound like an ideologue, like a zealot. There's a religious indignation that issues forth from your pulpit that the sinner and the atheist and the heathen have hardened their hearts and, and they refuse to see the light. They only view these games through the single lens of how they want to play it, how they engage with the medium, and what they believe is the one true way to experience video games. Now, this is where the confusion from earlier is really starting to catch up. Which people are these? The people who think that Elden Ring shouldn't have an easy mode? These are, these are the characteristics you're assigning to people who don't think Elden Ring should have an easy mode. Or have we swapped to the, admittedly, probably virtually non-existent, percentage of the gaming demographic who thinks that games shouldn't be more accessible? You see, it's really hard to tell because of how much you conflate the two when you think it might be um, of utility to an argument you're making. Anything that dares to challenge or confront that is met with hostility. Honestly, based on your behavior and your language in this video alone, I blame them in no way. I mean, you're being, you're being pretty foul. Because on the whole, a lot of these people only know or care about video games. <sighs> yep, I'm certain that's definitely true. They only care about video games and nothing else. I'm certain of it. They don't have other interests. Mm-hmm. If there's one thing Gamergate taught us, with all its gatekeeping, elitism, and hatred of minorities... <laughs> yep, that's... That's definitely what Gamergate was. It's just hating on them minorities. You know, I'd tell you to get a new shtick because this one's getting old, but let's be honest, this shit was old years ago. Oh, and, and don't get me to start singing the praises of gatekeeping because blessed are those who gatekeep the hobbies that they enjoy from those who want to, to get their prying spindly fingers into it and turn it into something else entirely to morph it into an aberration, to completely destroy it from within. Blessed are the gatekeepers. 
Hold the line, boys and girls. It's that people with no form of enrichment outside of video games can be right dickheads. You know, you should have just called this video, people who don't agree with me are bad people. That, that's just what you should have called it. They're disgusting, terrible, horrible, broken, sad, pathetic people with small genitals. Those who have pinned their entire sense of self on a single geeky medium naturally don't want a diverse range of people to get into video games. Well, of course, it's only it's only natural that people who like video games hate other... What are you talking about? What are you on about? Because then it will reflect how much of an individual they aren't. Listen, I know you're on your little hissy fit here, but surely you mean the opposite, right? How would having more homogeneity of everything around you make you feel like more of an individual? Surely it would be that having more homogeneity around you would make you feel like less of an individual, like you're just another one of those in the group. Whereas if everyone around you was like super diverse and no one was the same, surely that would make you feel like more of an individual because you don't match up with everyone else around you, right? When loving video games became mainstream, a lot of people who love only video games didn't feel special anymore. Well, wait, that's a different argument. That's not about the diversity of people who are into video games. That's just the amount of people who are into video games. And I highly, highly doubt that there are many people who see themselves as special, unique snowflakes because they like video games. So to the supposed From Software fans. Ah yes, because I, Jim Sterling, know who is and isn't truly a From Software fan. You know, for someone who bitches a lot about gatekeeping... The really hardcore ones who get way too invested in this shit. Elden Ring players who say that you should get better at the game are way too invested in this shit. That is certainly a position that you are allowed to have. Please stop. You'll be on the point crossed by the Undertale fan community at this point, which I say, as a huge Undertale fan, your endlessly antagonistic and frankly miserable attitudes whenever a new game comes out just puts people the fuck off. Does it put people off? Or, or does it put you off? Which I guess is indeed what you want. You clearly want to limit the number of people who can enjoy these games. Oh, absolutely. That, that's the only thing that they want. Their only goal is to limit the amount of people who can enjoy it. Of course, it, there's no other reason. There, there couldn't possibly be any other reason. But speaking as someone who really, really enjoys From Software's output, it's just fucking draining at this point. Oh, you, you've said that many, many times. Yes, I, uh, we, we did get the message. And you know? Maybe. You know, for all of your self-aggrandizing, for all of your representing yourself as a true Soulsborne fan, mm -hmm. you're not actually representative of the proper Soulsborne fan base. It's literally like I'm listening to a child. You may visibly represent it through the sheer volume of your caterwauling, but you're not representative of what the series is designed for, who the series is designed for. <sighs> And who, pray tell, is it designed for? Because for as much as it challenges and punishes a player, it's a series of jolly cooperation, of experiencing hardship together. You know, cooperation and support of one another is, is actually, it, it's kind of the vibe that I pretty much always get when I hear people talking about Elden Ring or these Soulsborne games. When I normally hear someone telling another person that they need to get good and that they need to practice and get better, it's done because, I mean, that's, that's how they're going to beat the game. I'm pretty sure that most of the people who are saying that you need to practice and get better at the game, I think that their ideal outcome is that you do practice and you do get better and eventually you do beat the game. There is this element of camaraderie that I see in these communities. Now, of course, I'm on the outside looking in. I, I don't really care about Soulsborne games myself, but... Oddly enough, it reminds me of uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King, at the end when all the hobbits are back in the Shire, and they're all looking at each other, and everyone else around them is dancing and having a great old time, but these four hobbits at that table, they they know, you know, they, they understand each other. They know what they've been through, and they can relate to 
each other in ways that a lot of other people just just can't. They overcame great trials and tribulations, and that gives them a sort of brotherhood in a way. And despite the ability to invade the worlds and ruin the lives of other players... Well, what if they're having a nice time, hmm? In the face of its overwhelming challenge, the Soulsborne series is ultimately about not being a fucking dick to other people. The Soulsborne series is about being nice? Okay. Um, sure. Let me explain that point many, many years ago. Well, could you explain the point now instead of many, many years ago? When Demon's Souls was released, I made this argument that it is one of the best multiplayer experiences. And I wasn't actually talking about any of the cooperative or uh, invasive elements of the game. I was actually talking about the little phantoms you see of other players. All right, all right existing in the world in the same areas as you. If you are unfamiliar, uh, Elden Ring does this as well. Uh, you see uh, very temporary glimmers of other players. Uh, yeah. In the same area as you, uh, performing actions in real time. Just the character models rolling, fighting, exploring, whatever. And I absolutely loved that as a concept because to me, it sent the message that even if you're on your own, you and a whole bunch of other players are suffering together. Um, I like the way I characterize the hobbits a little bit better, but go on. And that to me was a very crucial point of that experience. Uh, you might be facing all of these hardships, you might be facing them on your own, but so is everybody else. Shared suffering, it's better than suffering on your own. I'm gonna be honest, I do not know if you say that jokingly. Maybe this is just a really poor way of you trying to get across the concept like I did with the hobbits. It's this idea that if you and someone else go through particular tribulations and you overcome a great hardship as one another, then you can empathize with each other in a particular way, that there's a special camaraderie and empathy that comes along with that shared experience. And I do wonder, and I don't know if this will come up later in the video because I typically don't watch ahead too far. But if you are going to appeal to that sort of camaraderie and empathy between people who overcome these challenges, would the difficulty of those challenges, the greatness and the intensity of those challenges, would that make that camaraderie and empathy between those people who'd overcome it all the greater? I certainly know that when I'm going through a rough, traumatic, upsetting time, I find myself wishing everybody else was. You see, I understand that you say this as a joke, I think, but after watching this video, I do wonder. So yeah, that's what the Soulsborne series has always meant to me. That's lovely, but do you understand that, obviously, that's not going to be what the Soulsborne series means to everyone else, necessarily? Because at this point, I do genuinely question your ability to empathize with other people. Shared suffering, shared pain, and I think a lot of the people who truly love that series um, um, sort of embrace. Uh, we see this in the messages that are left on the floor for other players, warning them of impending doom. Yeah, but there's a difference between simply saying it's about shared suffering and the results created between people because of the suffering that they have shared. We see this with the amount of players that actually post up for cooperative play, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm very much a dedicated son, bro. I'm all about the co-op. And that's what I mean when I say that I'm better at video games than you, than all of you. Wait, I, I'm a little bit confused. You're not a very good communicator. Are you saying that you're better at video games than everyone else because you enjoy playing cooperatively? Co-op co -op games? Is that what you mean? Uh, I am just the best one because I understand uh, video games and you don't. Yeah, I legitimately do not know what you're trying to say. You're... As far as I know, you're saying that you're better at games than everyone else because you play cooperative games so you understand games better? That's all I got. That, that's all I got. Prick. Oh, I've been called far worse things by far better people, I assure you. Thank God for me.
Well, thank God the video's finally done. There's nothing left to be covered, really. Jim shills what he calls some anti-capitalist merch, and some keychains that say the gays can do whatever they want. Which isn't exactly the life advice that I'd be giving myself, but, you know, you do you, I suppose. But let us leave behind the foul childishness and bitter hatred of Jim Sterling's commentary and wrap up this response with some final thoughts. They say, inside of you, there are two wolves. Yeah, yeah, memes aside, it's not a bad metaphor for introspection. One of those wolves is kindness and empathy, understanding and selflessness. And the other wolf is anger and bitterness, bigotry, ignorance and cynicism. And I think it's pretty clear which one Jim has decided to feed. The world is full of people who think differently from you, and differently from me, different from all of us. And the reasons why they do think differently can be wildly diverse. It is important that as you travel through life's journey, you do not be so quick to judge others and to avoid having incredible bitterness and disdain for people who don't see things your way. Particularly if this is how you attempt to convince them in a video like this by insulting and just generally being rancid. So, before we leave, I'd like to give you a reminder about the makeshift plushie. Every single purchase helps me out a great deal, especially now with how well it's doing. These are limited time, and once the campaign's over, they will be gone for good. I have been sent a prototype, and he looks incredible. I'm very happy with how it's been made. And, you know, if the plushie isn't quite your thing, fair enough. I do have a Patreon, a Subscribestar. Those are, uh, those are going to be in the description, and, and you can... Of course, always check out the podcast that I run with my friends, Mahler and Fringy, called Every Frame of Pause, which is also linked below. Would love to see you there. So goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful day, a magical week, be well, and I shall hope to see you soon.